Okay, never mind. Okay, and then there we go. Very cool. Um, hi guys, just I wanted to say hello. I'm Mary Beth Temple. Um, my background, I used to do costumes for film and television and on Broadway, I worked in the New York City entertainment industry for a very long time. And I have been sewing for a very long time. So most of you know me here as a knitting instructor or a crochet instructor, uh, but I'm here today to give you some sewing tips. And these are not tips you're gonna necessarily find anywhere else. These are tips from my many, many years <laughs> of sewing practice. So we're gonna do hand sewing tonight and start at the very, very beginning. So let's uh, switch over to the tabletop, Allie. Oh, look at that. And let's get a little more light on the subject and we are ready to roll. So these are some supplies that I picked up at Michael's. These are called fat quarters. And these are great to practice on. And the difference between a fat quarter and a regular quarter of a yard that you might buy if you were buying yardage, when you get cotton fabric like this, it's normally 42, 45 inches wide. And if you were to go to the store and ask for a quarter of a yard, you would get a piece that is 45 inches wide and only nine inches tall because that's a quarter of a yard. Uh, a fat quarter, is also a quarter of a yard, but it is 18 inches tall by 21 to 23 inches wide. So it is a quarter of the yard, but the yard has been divided into quadrants. So it gives you a much bigger piece of fabric to work with. It's the same amount of square inches. I guess bigger is sort of the wrong thing to say, um, but the size and shape is a lot easier to work with. So I'm gonna work on this gray tonight just so we don't have anything too fancy going on, but they do have all kinds of different patterns that you can get at your Michaels store. While you're there, you're gonna to wanna to grab some needles. Now I'm using some bigger than usual needles today because I learned the last time I was here that if I use my teeny weeny sewing needles, you guys can't see them. <laughs> it's really hard for you to see what's going on. So I'm using um, embroidery needles today that have that nice point on them. But you can go to Michael's and you can buy sharps or betweens or quilting needles. The sharps are a little bit shorter than the quilting needles or the betweens. The quilting needles and the betweens are very similar, if not exactly the same, and the sharps are a little shorter. So if I am mending something or I am going to sew an item together, I'm gonna to sew two things together. I like to use the sharps because I like the shorter needle. It gives me a little more uh, room to maneuver, but you can grab whichever ones you want. The ones that you do not want, you do not want tapestry needles because those are blunt and we want that nice sharp point to get going. The next thing that is not a deal breaker, but I highly suggest it is a needle threader. These come in packs of three at Michael's and it's super easy to thread your needle with these, which I'm gonna do in one minute. And then let's talk about thread for a little bit. I have two different types of thread with me tonight that we're going to work with. One is the all-purpose, dual duty all-purpose XP. This thread, this can do everything. I sound like Stefan from SNL, but it literally is all-purpose. It's a fine weight, it's a polyester thread. It can go in your sewing machine. You can hand sew with it. You can do pretty much whatever you want with this thread. It's a fine weight and will work on pretty much any kind of project. But the other thing we have at Michael's is Cousin Clark button and craft thread. Now there's two things that make this different from the all purpose thread. One is it's a little bit thicker. And the other thing is it has a glossy coating. And what that means is it is less likely to tangle up on itself. It is less likely to tang, uh, to make knots because of that glossy coating. But the other thing that you need to know about button and craft, it is not meant for your sewing machine because the glossy coating that makes it perfect for hand sewing makes it gum up your machine. So you don't want that to happen. And also it's a little thick for machine sewing. So we have button and craft, and we have all purpose and both of those are available at Michael's. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just going to uh, wind off a little bit of yarn. I'm gonna use all purpose first. I 
usually pull out between 30 and 36 inches, but I've also been sewing for a very, very long time. So you might want to uh, do a little, a little less, particularly when you're getting started. And then if you want to, so that top end, let's see if I can do it. Uh, let me show you again. If you pull up on the end of the cap, it's a snap cap. You can put that little cut end in there and snap it down. Now it's not going to come unwound. How many of us had our mothers or grandmothers or aunties that had, uh, you know, the cookie, the cookie tin, <laughs> 900 spools of thread in it, and then the ends came out and they were every which way. So having that little snap cap will prevent that from happening. So I'm going to grab my needle and I'm going to grab my needle threader. So I'm going to take the pointiest part and stick and I'm going to push till it's all the way through. So you can see. Now I'm going to grab my cut end and put it through that big opening of the needle threader, which is far bigger than the opening of the, uh, of the um, needle itself. And I'm going to give it a little tug and look, the thread pulled right through. Now I can set my needle threader aside and get ready to sew. Now there's two different ways that we use thread like this. One is if we're sewing double and that is very durable, but also more likely to, to tangle up when you're sewing, where sometimes you just use one strand of thread at a time. So one little trick that I wanna give you to prevent tangling with all purpose thread or any other of the lighter threads, what I like to do, so you see I've threaded my needle but I haven't knotted it up yet. I'm gonna run that needle through the fabric. I like to do it three times, but three is not a magic number. It can be just a few times. And what this does is it takes some of the twist out of the yarn. See, see how it's twisting up when I'm pulling it through? It's going twisty, twisty. I wanna have it happen now <laughs> while, while I don't have a knot. See, and now it's happening a little bit less and a little bit less. And I'm just doing that to get some of that twist out and then I can knot it. So whether I'm using one strand or two strands, I'm gonna do one for this next little bit. So I'm just going to take my little end here and I'm going to wrap it around my index finger. So there's my little cut end and I wrapped around my index finger. Oh my goodness, there we go. And now I'm going to roll my thumb and finger, roll my thumb away from me, my index finger toward me. And that little cut end is going to go in the hole and make a knot. And it's okay if there's a little knot right there. Why that is easier than tying multiple overhand knots is because if you tie multiple overhand knots, the odds are they're not gonna line up exactly on top of each other. And you're going to have, you know, three or four or five overhand knots spread out and uh, that won't give you enough. So just doing here, let's do that one more time, just for, for visual sake. So there's my little cut in. I'm wrapping my thread around my index finger. I'm using my thumb and my index finger to roll the two together. I'm twisting them together. Now I'm gonna grab it over that loop, give it a little tug, and there's my knot. Now, of course, it looks much bigger because I have two on top of each other. But that is so much easier than trying to tie overhand knots. Allie, do we have any questions yet? We do not. I did actually think that the chat could possibly be broken, but it seems to be working properly. So feel free <laughs> if you have any questions, um, let us know in the chat and we will get to as many as we can throughout today's class. So I'm going to start with a, a stitch. Let me get some of this nonsense out of here. I'm going to start with a stitch that is very handy when you're hemming something, especially this is called a blind hem or a blind stitch. So 
So what I did for the, in this case, I folded up my raw, so here was my raw edge and I folded it up just a little bit to turn it under because I don't want that raw edge hanging out. And what I like to do is hide the knots whenever possible. So in this instance, I'm going to bring the needle up in that fold and then that knot is hidden. So to continue on with my hem, I'm going to pick just a few threads, the fewest threads I can get on the right side or the fashion side of the fabric and pull my thread through. And then I'm going to run my needle up, up, up under that fold. And I can go a little longer when I'm going up under that fold as opposed to going to the outside because that's not gonna show on the right side of the work. And as much as we can, we wanna go just exactly across from the fold to the right side of the fabric so that we don't have too much thread hanging out. So I'm going under the fold, fold this for distance. Oh. Now, when you get a little twisty knot like this, uh, you don't wanna to be too aggressive with it because if you pull it in the wrong direction, it's gonna get tighter. So you see what I did is I pulled it up by the loop to get it away from my work. And then I'm just going to put my needle between the two strands and pull them apart. Boop. And nine times out of 10, it'll pop right out like it just did. Last time we taught this class, I tried to make that happen on camera and I couldn't do it. So y'all got bonus content tonight. <laughs> So just a few threads on the right side of the fabric, fold for distance. A couple of threads on the right side of the fabric. So this is called a blind hem or a blind stitch. This is really good for trousers, not jeans. Obviously if I had jeans, I'd be trying to get my sewing machine out. But dress trousers for men or for women, curtain hems, dress hems, this is a really good one to know. And you see, I'm trying to go right across because I don't want to, I want to see as little thread as humanly possible. So here it is on the wrong side. And the other reason we don't want to see that thread, if it was say a trouser hem or something, you don't want your foot or your, uh, or your heel, you know, if you put your shoe on first by accident, but you don't want your toe to sort of go through the hole. But if you look at the right side of the work, you can barely see it. So I'm going through both pieces, but I'm going through one piece at a time. I'm not sewing up and down. I'm sewing just a little bit of gathering a couple of threads on one side. And then going just, let's see if I can get that a little closer. Literally, you can see the tip of my needle is just running up under the fold. And when I'm on the fold side, that's when I'm getting my distance because I don't want a big, loose, gappy stitch hanging out. When I want to end up off a thread, I want to do it sort of away from where it's going to be seen. So again, if I'm going to end off, if I'm doing this blind hem and I'm going to end my thread off on this side and there's a million different ways to do it. But what I like to do is take three little stitches, one, two, three, and that's going to hold it off. That's going to hold that yarn. Uh, yarn. <laughs> Can you tell I teach knitting a lot? That's going to hold that thread in place. Now, in this case, with a blind hem, since I have that fold, I'm going to go even a little bit farther and come up here. And then I'm going to cut my thread close. If you can hide a length of thread like I just did, it's hiding under that fold. That's great because it makes it less likely to pull out. But anywhere from two to four little tack stitches like I just made, that should keep that thread 
nice and tight and keep the work from undoing. Let's talk about, um, Allie, do we have any questions? Um, there are some questions here. So were you going through both sides um, of the fabric there? I was going through one side and then the other side and then one side and then the other side and then one side and then the other side. So a couple threads on this side because that's the side that shows. And obviously I would also pick a thread that coordinates. One of the, one of the many joys of uh, dual duty all purpose XP is it comes in a trillion colors. You, know, you can always find something that's going to match. And while we're talking about thread matching, another interesting little tip, if you cannot find the exact color of the fabric that you're working with, it's always better to go darker than lighter. If your thread is a little bit too light, it's gonna catch your eye and it's gonna draw your eye to your thread and you don't want that. If it's a little bit darker, it recedes into the color of the fabric that you're working with. So if you have a choice between too dark and too light, too dark is the way to go. Amazing. And then a question here from Miriam. Um, do you ever use a thimble? I personally do not use a thimble. Now I have to say, when I was sewing in a costume shop on Broadway, I had calluses. <laughs> I had a big callus here and I had a big callus there. Um, so uh, there are different kinds of thimbles that there are the old school metal ones that we're used to. They look like little, little tubes, the little round part on the top that you can stick your finger in. You wanna make sure that you get a size that's comfortable because some, you know, one size does not fit all on those old school metal thimbles. But also, you can also find at Michael's, you can find uh, leather ones that cover that area that I was just talking about that um, I got my calluses on. You can get like a long piece of leather that just covers that. And it, I find those a little easier to manage than the sticking your finger in the old school thimble. I don't like an old school thimble. To me, it's uncomfortable. I will say this though, I think for each and every one of us, no matter what we're learning, you're most comfortable with what you learn with. So if you feel like you need a, need a thimble and you start doing beginning sewing with a thimble, then that's going to be more comfortable for you because you learned with that attachment, if you will. Amazing. Anything else? Uh, which finger should you put a leather thimble on? Again, it depends on how you sew. I would put it on my index finger, but I also, I tend, that's where the back end of the needle tends to rub. I know people that push the needle through this way and they keep the thimble over here. I, I hate to say it, it doesn't, it, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's that you'll develop a kind of rhythm when you learn to sew. And the, the job of the thimble is to protect the sides of your fingers. So honestly, it doesn't matter where you put it as long as it's doing its job, if that makes sense. I hope that made sense. Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna move on. Let's talk about, um, now I cheated. I have this uh, button and thread, thread that I uh, threaded up earlier. What if I wanted to sew, I'm trying to think of the way, right way to articulate this. When you're sewing, you're sewing two things together. But if I'm doing a hem like I just did, that doesn't have the amount of wear on the thread on the seam that if I'm taking one piece and sewing it to another piece. So let's talk about sewing two, two bigger items together. Let's make a seam. So the easiest one, the one that everybody learned first, if you were my age and you were <laughs> learning how to do this. I remember doing this on little cardboard cards with pieces of yarn when I was in kindergarten is the running stitch. So for the running stitch, you come up through the work and go down through all the work. So I'm sewing these two pieces together. So I'm going through all the layers. I know somebody will ask that because they very kindly asked that last time. And now I'm coming up. So this is called a running stitch. It is the basis of all the stitches. This is the first one that everybody learns. So what you want to do is you want to pull the thread tight enough that they butt up against each other, but you don't wanna pull it too tight because if you pull it too tight, it will gather up and become more narrow. 
which we don't want. And the other thing, and you'll get, uh, you'll get better at this with practice, like everything else in life, you wanna make your stitches as consistent as possible. You don't wanna have a little teeny one and then a great big one. So now you're, you notice that my, my cut end was caught in there. I just pulled it up a little bit, pulled that cut end up a little bit so it's out of my way. So I'm going down. And I'm coming up. Then that a little tug. And you see that even though I didn't do my little going through the fabric three times trick with this with this uh, thread, it's not tangling up on me because it has that uh, has that coverage on it because it's made for hand sewing. So a couple of things about the running stitch. One thing that's good, it looks the same on both sides. Now, is this the most durable stitch? It is not. And the other problem with the running stitch, if you get caught, if you get your finger caught or your toe caught or whatever, it can gather up the fabric like this and pull itself out. So it is not the absolute most durable of the hand sewing stitches, but there's a couple ways we can get around that. I'm trying to undo my mess here. I made a little too tight gather and now I'm trying to fix it. So this is a running stitch. Here it is on this side, here it is on the other side, it's the same. If you want to do the running stitch because it's easy and you just learned it and that is the easiest way for you to sew, you can do something now called the double running stitch. So here's my running stitch. Now to go back, now that the words are weird, I'm gonna go down where I went down before. And I'm going to come up where I came up before. But what's going to happen, so you could see when I just had the running stitch, I had a line of dashes, right? See, I just said it didn't tangle and now it does. <laughs> if you only knew the awkward angle at which I have to sew so that you guys can all see what I'm doing. So I'm going down where I went down before. And I'm going up where I came up before. So this is a double running stitch. And notice, do you see what's happening? It's filling in the spaces between the dashes. So this is more durable because it has more coverage and it's less likely to come undone. And also if you're uh, interested in doing some embroidery, we're gonna have an embroidery class later in the summer. Uh, but this is also a stitch that can be used for embroidery, a running stitch or a double running stitch. I swear to goodness, tonight is not night. What you want to do though, when you have little tangles like this, you try not to tug them too tight. Because if you tug them too tight, they're in there for life. <laughs> it's far easier to sort of go in there with a needle and, and try to untwist them. I'm just gonna pull out my cut end, I think. And then that will solve my problem. You will, again, the more you sew, the easier it will be to solve your problems. And once again, when I'm going to finish off, I'm gonna find an out of the way place. There we go. And take just a couple of tack stitches. I went one, two, three, and we're gonna just pretend that I pulled that all the way through. And then if I had room to hide it, then I would. Again, just I'm hiding it in here where it won't be seen. The longer that little thread tail is, the less likely it is to pull out, right? But of course I don't wanna see it. So I only leave that extra thread tail if I have someplace good to hide it. So now if you look at this, Instead of we had dashes, 
on both sides. I now have a straight line on both sides. And it's a little more crooked on the opposite side because I wasn't paying that much attention because again, I'm sitting at a very odd angle. <laughs> You're just gonna have to trust me on that. Now, the last thing, I, there's one last thing I wanna say about the running stitch. Let me just um, get this started real quick. See if I can uh, make the untwist happen. If you uh, get the hang of it, and if you're working shorter stitches, if you don't want to go up and down like I just did, it's also fine to sort of, we call this scooping. You can scoop your needle and go through a couple of stitches at a time. Now, if you're going to do that, then I would go with a quilting needle or a between because it's longer. That's not as easy to do with a sharp. Let's see, I can just scoop like this instead of going up and down and up and down and up and down. I can sort of dig in here. And that makes it a little bit easier to do. Allie, we have any questions? We do have a couple of questions. Okay, well um, you ask, I'm gonna load up amazing. a new needle for the next stitch. Marie wants to know, um, is it necessary to make the thread double? Um, no. Um, so whether I make the thread double or not has to do with two different things. One is how durable I want it to be. If I'm making a, you know, a lining for a purse or a bag or something, I'm going to try and use that double thread because I want that seam to be super weight bearing. But the other thing that it has to do with is the weight of the fabric. If I'm doing pretty little loosey goosey chiffon or a gauze or silk or a rayon top or something like that, I'm only gonna use one strand of thread because I don't want a big bulky stitch. I want something nice and fine that's not going to show. So two strands for durability or for heavyweight fabric, one strand for lightweight fabric so it doesn't show. Fabulous. And a question here um, from Michelle, what would you suggest using the running stitch for? Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't use the running stitch a lot unless I'm gonna gather. Um, but it's one of those things, if you understand how the running stitch works, then understanding how the rest of the stitches works is easier. If that makes sense, it's just, um, it's just a basic stitch that sort of everybody learns. And again, I know I was joking earlier about the cards, but I remember being in, you know, pre-K with the little cardboard cards with the hole and you went in and out with the, with the yarn with a plastic tip. So uh, of course I'm old, so maybe they don't do that anymore, but the running stitch is the thing that most people are uh, familiar with. And just one more question, one here from sure. Yvonne. Um, when you were doing your three stitches for the knot, do you go into the material at all? Yes, I am going into the material, but I'm just catching a few threads. And uh, for the example, the one that we just did, this is four layers of fabric because I had made a fold. So I wasn't going through all four layers because the other thing you may have noticed when I was showing you how to scoop, it was really hard to go through all four layers. So I started going through just two because scooping through four layers, it was, it was heavy. It was heavy going. So um, I do catch a couple of threads of the material, not just the thread that I was sewing with. Fantastic. All right, moving on. Oh, last thing with the uh, with the running stitch. If you want to gather something up, if you're making a ruffle, or uh, running stitch is perfect for gathers. So uh, that is the other place that I would use a running stitch. Um, so the other thing I want to show you while we're on this type of a stitch is the back stitch, and I'm going to go I'm going to go back and just go through two layers because it will make my life easier. So, and this is more of a scooping sort of a stitch than the way I first did the uh, running stitch. So on the running stitch, I came up in the back and then I went towards, I'm right-handed, so I went towards my left hand. For the back stitch, I'm gonna go towards my right hand and I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna come up past that first stitch. So let's look at this real close. This is where I came up. This is where I'm going down. 
and this is where I'm coming up for the next stitch. And let's look at it on the back. So you see on the back, that's a huge stitch. It's a double length stitch, but that's how it's meant. That's how it's meant to be. So we're okay. So I'm gonna pull that until it lays flat. Now I'm going to go down right where that other stitch is and come up past it. And pull it through. Down and come up past it. So this is called the back stitch. So it gives you the same look on the side of the work that's facing you, the right side of the fabric as a double running stitch. And it's a little bit faster because you're not going over the same line of stitching twice. You're not going over the same square footage two times. However, this looks, let me get a couple more stitches in before I make my next point. Uh, this stitch is also used in embroidery a lot, a lot for outlines and stuff. So again, I'm, I'm preparing you all for our embroidery class that we're teaching in August. I hope you all come back and join me because I'm really, really excited about that class. So if you look at the front, you have your straight line like you had during your double running stitch. But if you look at the back, you've got essentially twice the coverage. Now, the other thing to know then is you're using you know, twice the amount of thread. You have to, you'll have to change thread more frequently because you've got this sort of overlap in the back. But this is, um, again, this is another one that's really super durable and is you're only making one pass across the fabric as opposed to a double running stitch, which you have to do two passes across the fabric to get the same effect. But I wouldn't do this stitch if it was gonna be visible on both sides. Now in embroidery, Sometimes we use uh, this side as the right side, and sometimes we want this side. Sometimes we want to see that extra thread, but uh, I'm going to save all my embroidery tips for that other class. <laughs> so that's a back stitch. So again, if I had to do a repair, if I had to fix something, this is a st if I had to sew two things together, I had a hole in my purse lining or something like that. The back stitch is a very common stitch that I would use to fix some things up. Allie, do we have any questions on the back stitch? We are oh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna just say, don't you leave me too. <laughs> It'd be a nightmare if I was in here all by myself. I, I need my people. So if, if I was gonna end off this back stitch, I would end off on the back or the wrong side of the work. Again, I'm just grabbing a couple of, of strands of the fat and I'm not going through the front because I don't want to see the knot on the front, right? And again, you'll notice I'm not cutting super close to where that tack just ended those little three stitches. Because again, I know I've said it, but just this is a really good visual clue. The closer that cut end is to that last stitch, the more likely it is that it's gonna pull out. And I don't want it to pull out. Now, that said, and this is a very esoteric conversation to be having, but if something's going to rip because you know you stepped on it or the dog jumped it on, on it or, or what have you, you would rather that your thread rip and you have to sew that seam up again than to have your actual fashion fabric rip. You don't want your fabric to rip because that would be a harder thing to patch. So, um, and we have a class on that coming up too. Now that I think about it, we have visible, visible mending next month also. So as frustrated as you might be to have to mend something that you've already mended, you would still rather have the thread break then have the actual garment or item rip because if it doesn't rip in a way that's easy to patch then you have way more sewing ahead of you yeah 
Now I'm just thread. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, Annette wants to know, um, how do you prevent the thread from curling, even though you pulled your thread through several times before starting? Um, there's, there's a couple things. One is, and this sounds really kind of gross, but you do have naturally occurring oil in your fingers. Sometimes you can uh, just run it through your hands and let the oils that naturally occur on your skin will help it lay flat. That's thing number one. Um, the other thing, and this is again, something if you have been sewing, let me see if I can grab that other needle. This is a little long for me to show the thing. Sometimes if it gets too twisty, now let me see if I can make it twist. <laughs> It only ever um, makes a glaring error if I don't want it to. It doesn't do it when I do want it to. So if it's if it's all twisted, if I've got one strand and it's all twisted up like this, perhaps, and I'm having a hard time. Um, I'm not sure I can do this on this camera. I will literally hold it up and let it untangle. Now, again, I use that thread a lot, so it doesn't want to do it. But if this was all twisted up and I let it dangle like this, the needle would go like this and it would untangle the thread all by itself. The weight of the needle would help it untwist. So that's another little tip that can be handy. And now I've lost my other needle. My goodness, give me one second, you guys. Allie, do you have any questions while I'm fishing around here for the other needle? Um, let me see. <laughs> I don't, we don't have any other questions at the right. moment. So I'm gonna show you one more little hem real quick. Um, now this is something that I use for, again, nicer clothes. These are hems that I use for higher end items. And the reason is this, if I have done, where's my, oh, there you are. Give me one second, y'all. I, I do not have it together today. We're gonna pretend that you didn't hear me uh, just rip that fabric. If you um, are thinking about the hem that we did with the blind hem, there's no what we call lateral movement. So picture this, if this is the hem of your skirt or your trousers, and we did the blind hem that we did before, nothing's gonna move. It's going to stay exactly where it is. Now this one, which is called herringbone hem, has lateral movement. And again, if the fabric has a loose weave, is a little stretchy, is in a situation where your uh, purse might catch onto it or something else might catch onto it. Um, something that has lateral movement, which just means side to side movement, um, is a little easier to handle. So for example, um, this is the herringbone hem. So I use the herringbone hem instead of the blind hem in a situation where there's going to be movement, either because the fabric of the, I, you know, different fabrics have different weaves. So I came up in my fold and hid my knot. Now, you notice before with the blind hem, we were going from right to left and I am right-handed. For the herringbone hem, we're going left to right and I'm still right-handed. So I'm going to go up to this fabric, just this fabric, not the one with the fold in it. And right to left, I'm gonna grab a couple of threads and go through. Now I'm gonna come down to my fold and I'm gonna go right to left. I might grab a few more threads down here because again, nobody's gonna see that. Right to left on that front facing fabric, that right side of the fabric. Right to left on the fold. And you notice that I'm keeping my needle under my working thread, the thread that's already attached to the live stitches. You know what I'm going to say next? This is also an embroidery stitch. I always feel like embroidery came about because people got bored mending their clothes and tried to make it pretty. Do you know what I mean? Just gonna put a few more stitches on this and then I'll show you 
what it looks like on the other side. Oh, and the other thing I want to mention, um, you can also buy products to put on your thread. You can buy wax um, that you can run a little bit of wax on your thread, prevents it from curling. There are also sort of oil, like machine oil, but for thread, there's also products you can use to, uh, to coat your thread. I don't like them. I don't think the thread needs anything else on it. And again, I know I was fussing a little with that button and craft thread, but I do promise you it's because the awkward angle at which I am stitching. If I was sitting down to stitch a project, I certainly would not be holding my work at the angle that I am right now. So I know that it looked a little fussy to you guys, but normally that is not a thing that happens. And again, it's because of that glossy coating. So here's my herringbone hem. Now, if this has some, some tugging, you can see it can go side to side. It's more flexible than that blind hem. So what does that mean? That means on an item or a garment that has a lot of movement to it, it's less likely to tear. You can see it more on, this is the wrong side of the work, you can see it more, and you can see it a little bit more on the right side of the work. But again, if you very cleverly got your dual duty all XP all purpose thread in the correct color, even that is not so much, that's not such an obnoxious, uh, that's not such an obnoxious amount of stitching to see. So that is the herringbone hem. So we did the blind hem, and we did the herringbone hem, and we did the running stitch, the double running stitch, and the back stitch. So the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to go thread up, I'm going back to my button and craft thread. I want to uh, talk about uh, sewing on buttons because last time we taught this class, that was the question that everybody had and I was doing it at uh, you know, one minute before the end. So let me thread up again in my button and craft thread and we'll talk about the different ways to sew buttons together buttons on rather not together. We don't sew buttons together, generally speaking. Ali, do we have any more questions? No other questions right now. Okay, very cool. Then I will thread faster. <laughs> you guys are very quiet tonight. Uh, here, I'll thread on, I'll thread on camera so you have something to look at. So once again, here's the pointy, pointy, pointy part of my needle threader. I'm pushing it through the hole and it's gonna, huh, except I missed. It's gonna collapse and then pop open on the other side. And then I'm gonna go ahead and stick my cut end through that big opening and pull the little wire through. And then it's threaded. Now, a lot of us, uh, if you if you learned again, if you were taught sewing when you were a young person, a lot of us were told to lick the thread. <laughs> um, generally, it can help, but generally speaking, all you get is wet, floppy thread. The thread needs to have enough uh, body to go through the hole. If it's wet and floppy, it it doesn't want to go through the eye of the needle. Now. Um, also, if you look at, uh, at, at old movies, you'll see them licking the thread and sticking it through. Ugh. Um, another thing you can do is what we were talking about with getting some of the twist out of the thread, which was use the natural oil in your fingers to smooth that out. And honestly, if you've made too many attempts and it gets fuzzy and it just doesn't want to go, just cut it again. Give yourself a nice, clean, fresh edge to go in there. But those little needle threaders that I just showed you, they're very inexpensive and Michael's has them in a three pack. And I, uh, the older I get, the uh, less interested I am in trying to thread needles by myself. <laughs> I would really rather just pick up the needle threader and call it a day. So for my buttons, I'm gonna use two strands together. I'm not gonna sew with one strand, I'm gonna sew with two. And again, the reason is durability. So I'm gonna go ahead and not those two together. There's my knot. So there's two types of buttons. I mean, there's a million types of buttons, but there's two general types of buttons out in the world and they're called shank buttons. That is a shank button. So you can see it has a little pokey out part on the back and that's where the thread goes. That's where the hole is. That's a shank button. And you can't see the stitching on the top when that is on a shirt 
or a purse or whatever it's on, you don't see any thread, you just see the button. The other kind are these buttons that have holes in them. And so there's a couple different ways to go about it. So once again, if I'm sewing a button on and I have the opportunity, I don't think it's gonna work particularly well because it's a teeny tiny button, but I'm gonna go top down to start with and I'm gonna hide that knot under the button because nobody's gonna see it. You can absolutely come from the bottom up, but I want the back of my work to be nice and smooth. So I'm gonna hide that button right here. Now I'm gonna come up pretty close to the knot. I'm gonna take my needle through the shank Now, the first couple of stitches, you need to make sure that button doesn't move around. You want it exactly where you want it to be. So I hold it with my thumb and forefinger, my uh, forefingers underneath holding it down. So I'm gonna go down. And of course it's twisting because that's the kind of day I've been having. I'm sorry to have you all suffer through my bad day. <laughs> there we go. Now it's all through. So see my knot is hidden under there and I've gone through that shank. So now it's best to keep going in the same direction. So I am coming up below the shank going through the shank, going down on the other side. Coming up on this side. And now that I've gotten two stitches in there, you can see it's, it's not going anywhere, it's not moving. So uh, you have to, you can pay a little less attention once you get those establishing stitches in there. Now you don't have to go crazy because again, with this button and craft thread, it's pretty sturdy. It's not going anywhere. Four or five passes through the shank is usually enough. And the other thing you'll find particularly with button and craft, as you start going through that shank over and over and over again, it's gonna fill up. So if you can't get the needle through there any uh, anymore, you're done, <laughs> that's enough. So there's my other side. And I'm just gonna take my little tack stitches here, my three little tack stitches, one, two, three. And once again, three is not a magic number. You can take however many you feel like you need, but three is my habit. And then I'm gonna cut it, but not super close. I'm gonna just let that little bit of little bit of thread hang out. Allie, do we have any questions on shank buttons before I move on to the ones with the holes? Nope, no questions. You guys are so quiet tonight. I think it's the heat. <laughs> I think it's the heat. So the last time we did this class, I grabbed a button with two holes, but now we have four. So I think four is actually more fun. So same deal. If I have the opportunity, I'm gonna go from the top down just to hide my knot. And in that instance, I'm gonna clip that thread pretty short because I don't wanna see it. Now I'm gonna hold my button. So again, till I get those first couple in there, um, I really have to keep a good grip on it so it doesn't move. I, I need it to stay where I want it to stay. So I have it held with my, uh, my thumb and my forefinger have it in a good place. So you have, when you have two holes like this, you have two options. One is to make bars. So I'm coming up from behind. going down. Now what I like to do when I'm doing the bars is uh, do one on each side again, just to keep it 
keep it secure, then I don't have to worry so much that it's gonna move up, down. So I'm gonna come back to the first bar and you can see I'm fishing around, it's a fishing expedition. If you poke your needle up and you hit button, you're not exactly under the hole. You have to just poke around a little bit until you find the correct hole to bring your needle up through. But it, after you get it established, it's easier. She says, as she then can't find, <laughs> can't find the hole, there we go. Earl has a question here. Um, can I, I just wanna finish one oh, thing yeah. real quick and then absolutely. So if I do it this way, and I'm doing it properly. I have bars on the front and I have, uh, it's hard to see because it's little, but I have sort of an X on the back because I'm going back and forth between the two bars. The alternative is to make an X on the front. Now I like how the X looks, but not everybody does. So in that case, I'm going bottom left to top right. Whoop, I'm running out of room in my holes. <laughs> and then I'm going bottom right to top left. So I can do it that way. And then instead of having bars in the front, I'll have my little X and I'll have bars in the back. Allie, do you wanna ask your question? Cause I do wanna talk very briefly about how to fasten these off. Sure, um, Carol wanted to know, do you have a recommended stitch for hemming or stitching sheer fabrics? I would use that blind hem every chance I got because that blind hem is really hard to see and that is what you want. So that blind hem that we did, I don't know if you joined us at the very beginning, but it's the first stitch that I taught. I like to use the blind hem on those lightweight fabrics. Great. Allie, anything else? And just one more question from Michelle here. Um, bars or crisscross, or is it just a preference for sewing on buttons? I feel strongly that it's a preference. I don't think one is any sturdier than the other and I am crisscross applesauce all the way. So this thing that I'm gonna show you next, this is the thing that makes it sturdy and also makes it why it doesn't matter whether you do crisscross or bars. When I put this button on, the shank button, the shank gives some space between the bottom of the button and the top of the fabric, right? So if I'm going to, uh, button my shirt and I'm putting this through the other layer of fabric that has the buttonhole on it, that other layer of fabric snugs up under the shank. If I have a button with holes, notice if I pull super tight, that bottom of the button and the fabric that I'm working on are really, really close together. So when I'm finishing off a shank button, I'm going to uh, wind it to four or five times, three, four, five. I'm gonna wind up this button thread and then end it off. And the reason is I am creating space for the other layer of fabric to sit. Now, if this was a shirt button or a skirt waistband or something like that, totally not a big deal. The shank doesn't have to be that big. However, if you're sewing buttons on a duffel coat or a heavy wool coat, I'm from New York, we know about winter coats. You wanna not pull the button super tight to the fabric. You wanna give it an eighth or a quarter of an inch and then make a nice tall shank because if your coat is this thick, it has to go somewhere. Do you know what I mean? And if you don't give it that extra shank, if you don't give it that extra space, what's gonna happen is your coat's gonna come unbuttoned when you don't want it to, or uh, there's gonna to be too much tension on the button and you're going to rip the fabric where the button was. So give yourself that little shank every chance you get, but the thicker the fabric that you're working on, the more shank you need to have. All right, Allie, we're about to wrap it up. It's uh, three minutes before the end of the hour. So if we have any more questions, now's your chance. Let me double check and see if I've got them all. I think we have got all the questions here. All um, right, well then I'm gonna 
let you wrap it up. You guys can find me on Instagram at um, Hooked for Life LLC. That's H O O K E D number four L I F E L L C. If you have any questions, you want to show me what you're working on, you want me to answer a question, then uh, go ahead and hit me up on Instagram. And then I'm going to let Allie do her good night thing. But thank you so much for coming. And like I said, we have visible mending coming up and embroidery among the other things that I teach, but I know those two are coming up. So if you like this class, you're going to like those. And now I'm going to stop talking, let Allie do her thing. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for joining us at Michael's Community Classroom. Uh, again, just a reminder that you'll be able to find this recording on Michael's YouTube in about 24 hours and then on their website in about 48 hours. Um, if you are able to make anything with your um, with the skills that you learned today. Don't forget to use hashtag Yarnspirations when you share those posts on social media. Perfect. And also hashtag Make It With Michaels. Yes, and hashtag <laughs> Can you tell Make we It. We don't have our person tonight. We're just making it up as we go along. But thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great one.